Welcome to the fifth episode of the Halihewa podcast with your host Abigail Kima. Throughout COP, we are interviewing young people from across the world and uh, climate experts about what is happening at COP, uh, what their reactions are, are they getting the expectations uh, acted upon or not. And today on set, we have Kwaile Monaheng, who is from Lesotho. Um, he's doing amazing work at home on energy. Uh, welcome. Thank you for having me, Abby. Um, really glad to be here at mm-hmm. COP27 in Sharma Sheikh in Egypt. So yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your, on your show yeah, as well. Actually, yeah. So tell us about yourself and what you do. Um, my name is Kwaile Monaheng. I'm from the Kingdom of Lesotho, uh, Southern Africa. Mm-hmm. And I would consider myself a, a, an associate, a climate storyteller, um, as well as an African you know, for um, energy transition, um, thinking about where Africa should be. So I think what I do just on a basic form is that I'm currently still finishing off my master's at UCT, African Climate and Development Initiative, ACDI at the University of Cape Town. And I'm also the associate director for solar company, Hansa Energy. So yeah, that's a bit of what I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And why is this impo- work important for you? Uh, wow. Um, I suppose if we start with a bigger picture of the fact that there's 600 million Africans without electricity, um, in 2022, uh, with, you know, how far the African continent has come, I really think we need to interrogate that a little further and find out why that's the case. Um, I'm really interested in climate, energy and development as three intersecting crises as to where Africa has been, you know, mm-hmm. not at the forefront of these. Yeah. So I'm quite interested in, you know, how perhaps Lesotho and these narratives and how I can tell a different narrative of Africa. Um, also a different narrative of, Les- of Lesotho and the importance of, you know, leading that transition to renewable energy. Mm-hmm. So this work is definitely important to me because you get to COP, you get to see, you know, the the people responsible for, you know, the keys to climate action. And I'm glad to be here because you really get to get an insight into the negotiations process. You really get the opportunity to be able to take this technical knowledge and, you know, disseminate it down, mm-hmm. excuse me, to the communities who are actually most affected on the front line. Yeah. By this. So I think that's something quite interesting for me to be here and what I'm going to take from this COP. Mm-hmm. Um, back to Lesotho, and back to, you know, South Africa. And, and Southern Africa, perhaps, yeah, in Africa. Mm-hmm. We're still in Africa, by the way, so yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we tend to forget that. Um, <laughs> so is this your first COP? Yeah, this is my first COP. And um, how, how has the experience been like so far? The first thing I will remember for the next COP mm-hmm. is running shoes. That is the first thing I'm going to, like, remember to bring. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been very busy, very chaotic. Mm-hmm. Um one thing I forgot to mention is that I'm also an associate, uh, program associate at PowerShift Africa and Kenya. Mm-hmm. So, wow, it's been, you know, we've been attending side events. We've been, um, you know, having meetings. It's been really chaotic. Um, but I'm glad to be here and really glad to, you know, understand the, the importance of operating in the climate space, particularly from a civil society perspective and being able to amplify the African voice while being here at the same time. So it's been very intense, but mm-hmm. such an amazing learning experience and such an amazing learning um, curve. Steep, but very important. So tell us about uh, Hansa, Hansa Energy, is that right? Yeah, Hansa Energy. Hansa, Hansa. Energy. Hansa. Okay. Hansa. Okay, tell us um, more about that. Hansa Energy is a solar company operating in the kingdom of Lesotho. Mm-hmm. We are operating in the highlands and we basically try to bring social or well, basic services to the communities, which can't be done without, you know, energy access. So mm-hmm. we're basically confronting energy poverty in Lesotho, mm-hmm. um, particularly to the most vulnerable communities. And we're saying that there's an opportunity here to co-create renewable energy solutions, sustainable development um, interventions that cater to the communities on the ground mm-hmm. and change the narrative around what it means to be an expert. Because, you know, we 
can be at COP, we can be in the space where we're writing or where we're drafting all of these amazing initiatives, but do they really translate down to the local people who need them? Can they be localized? Yeah. So I think it's very important that as we implement, you know, these interventions that um, indigenous knowledge um, is something that we take very seriously. And we also need that in order to co-create those solutions on the ground. You know, mm -hmm. one very interesting thing about um, the way we operate or our theory of change mm -hmm. is this idea of indigenous knowledge. But the mere fact that we can operate with a chief, mm -hmm. um, you know, interactions, and then we're able to reach a lot of communities as well. So it's very, you know, it's very key, yeah. particularly because renewable energy is the future. Mm -hmm. Renewable energy is, you know, Africa, Africa has the biggest potential. But the fact that we're able to take renewable energy and localize it, um, acknowledging that they're already transformative or the already, um, they're already, how do I put this? They're already existing, um, you know, practices on the ground. Mm -hmm. Something very important for us uh, yeah. because a, lo a lot of the interventions we do aren't yeah. necessarily taken because, well, just this this is just in a general. When you just apply something loosely on the ground without localizing it, mm -hmm. without you, without talking to those communities to advance it, yeah. you run the risk of that failing and of that, you know, zero implementation because the communities don't understand what you're doing. You're yeah. basically writing the narrative. So what we're doing is that we're trying to um, co-create that narrative, but also hand them the pen through energy access and take the lead from them with mm -hmm. what they actually need. So they can become the orchestrators of the, uh, you know, of the, of the actions they need. Yeah. 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 So um, you've talked about communities not being able to, to take in what you want to provide if yes, they've yes, not yes. been informed or consulted. Yes, yes. And I think uh, I completely agree with you because I believe people act from a point of information without that education, whatever uh, I'm supposed to receive may not be really useful for me because maybe it's not what I need. And I think what you've said is really important. And I saw you won an award. Mm. An intern in did you say international or global award? Local. Local. Okay. Well. Local. Global, global, local, <laughs> continental, African. Um uh -huh. yeah, look, I uh, think I just wanna maybe let me just track back. I'm just saying in general, mm -hmm. interventions that are applied to you know particularly African countries mm -hmm. are top down. Um they are at times very inaccurate and don't necessarily and this is like in a general sense. Um, where we've seen in the past where sustainability interventions of even renewable energy, sustainability interventions of, you know, um, progressive or, you know, um, solutions, mm -hmm. they don't localize what's on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, they run the risk of not being able to be translated efficiently or um, taken by those communities because you don't really understand them. To, to, you, under, you don't really understand their needs. Yeah. So, um, this is why most solutions on the continent, uh, particularly when it comes to development, uh, have failed. Yeah. Not because, um, not because they're inappropriate, but because the local translation, you know, is, 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 is not applied well. Because yeah. you have to acknowledge the already existing, um, the already existing, uh, structures, the already existing, uh, I don't know how to put it in words, but there's something existing in a space before you enter and yeah. you need to acknowledge that the already, the already structures, um, mm -hmm. albeit, um, the renewable, uh, energy. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I'll just make an example because I can't put this properly. Mm -hmm. When it comes to renewable energy, you're mm -hmm. talking about giving a community power, mm -hmm. but they've been, I mean, advanced power if we think about um, you know, solar power or mm -hmm. wind power or whatever you're trying to do mm -hmm. is that these people with solar power have been using candles and kerosene, mm -hmm. um, you know, light for a very long time. So yeah. if you're asking them to transition to renewable energy, mm -hmm. you know, you need to localize those solutions. You need to co-create those solutions, yeah. but you need to take the lead from them mm -hmm. in order to understand how to actually implement that further, yeah. in order to understand how they can be co-creators of their own knowledge. And even, you know, I think the interesting thing about being able to use indigenous knowledge as a, as a, um, as a unique selling point, as our, um, you know, value proposition, 
So you've talked about um, how most of the time when it comes to Africa's case for development or energy needs, it needs is normally they use a top-down approach mm-hmm. and uh, forgetting that there were systems that already existed yeah. within communities and it would be really important to focus on building on those systems that are already there. So how, how has that been like for you with Hansa? I really think that meeting communities at the point of equality and understanding that those on the front line are actually the experts we can learn from mm-hmm. really allows us to, you know, carry those implementations quite strongly because mm-hmm. we've been able to deepen our understanding and take the lead from these communities and understand that their needs mm-hmm. go far beyond electrification, you know. Yeah. While energy poverty is the bigger um, picture, mm-hmm. we also need to understand that communities are very far from social services, they're very far from basic services. Mm-hmm. And this really, I mean, imagine that, imagine your whole life, mm-hmm. your everyday life being dependent on light. Yeah. What, is that, what does that mean for education? What does that mean for industry? You know, mm-hmm. electricity is one of the biggest, perhaps the biggest way in order to develop. Mm-hmm. So if we think about what that means in a community that's far from social services, if we think about what light means for childbearing, mm-hmm. if we think about what energy means for survival, what energy means for development, you know, these people are, you know, on the periphery. But at the same time, there are already existing systems of indigenous knowledge that, you know, that guide our intersections, that guide our interventions, rather. Mm -hmm. And I think one really unique, amazing thing about Lesotho is the fact that, you know, indigenous knowledge is the cornerstone of the things that we, that that we identify with Mm -hmm. to be proud to be a Lesotho. For instance, one of the most important um, things that really talk about indigenous knowledge is the Lesotho calendar, Mm -hmm. uh, Silema Saba Soto which is an indigenous knowledge calendar that is even used even now in the modern um mm-hmm. you know in the modern era yeah. where every single month is an instruction on how right. to interact with the environment how to interact with the land mm-hmm. and you know um traditional basutu used this in order to you know the, the pastorals so they use this in order to understand what the changing environment in order to understand what to do mm-hmm. where, where 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 the environment is involved and that's also a spiritual thing as africans that you know that that guide how we interact and our connections with the land. So in order to understand how our interventions also take the lead from that indigenous knowledge calendar Mm -hmm. of Silomo Sawasoto, and, you know, that's something very important that we need to amplify. That's a very interesting story that we need to think about how we weave this into, Mm -hmm. you know, technocratic climate, climate, you know, technical climate um, or sustainable development interventions or solutions. So indigenous knowledge is definitely something very important that we need to take along with us even as we you know as we reach for um uh very technical solutions 100 yeah. percent yeah i completely agree with you and um in very simple terms mm-hmm. uh, what would energy transition look like for africa i think energy transition for africa um can be conceptualized into you know i talked about the three crises of Uh, climate, energy, and development. Mm -hmm. And because Africa has never been at the forefront of these narratives, the forefront of this implementation, Mm -hmm. it's basically been part of other countries' plans, Mm -hmm. you know, geopolitical sense. So I think for me, energy transition is simple. Renewable energy is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we need to transition away from fossil fuels Mm -hmm. um, because the developed world, uh, because if you think about um, the pandemic, Mm -hmm. COVID pandemic, if you think about the Russia-Ukraine war, Europe, is now faced with, um, you know, energy insecurity. And I think if you think about the real concept of development and how they're moving back, most of them, some of them, are moving back to coal, it really begs the question of what does it mean to be a first world country if you, if the imposition was renewable energy, but Mm -hmm. that you're moving back to, you know, to, to, to carbon, to heavy carbon emission, um, economy. So that's something very important to think about how we, even start to think about, you know, energy transition. So when I put it in the context of um, where we want to go, is the fact that when we um, implement energy transition, we can't repeat the mistakes of the past. We can't repeat the same injustices that come with um, the fossil fuel emissions or the fossil fuel industry, rather. If I make the example of our hydro um, power plant, the Lesotho Islands Water mm-hmm. Project, you know, the consultations, um, the 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 free and prior consent, 
of the communities was the idea of civic participation was really, you know, was absent from its inception. Mm -hmm. So when we think about how those injustices still um, permeate now, even yeah. in the, you know, become perverse right now, even in the modern era, we realize that um, communities have actually been excluded from any decision making about the, um, the Sultanis Water Project. The communities are still being able, the communities are still um, are kind of left worse off mm -hmm. in development so that almost you know you have this narrative where they don't trust um what it means to be you know what it means to be compensated what yeah. it means to be you know to be really taken on board so civic mm -hmm. participation needs to guide um even the implementation of renewable energy solutions the transmission lines uh, the distribution um solar power plants as we wrap up, um, do you have hope for this COP in terms of delivering African priorities and what is the one thing that will make you call this a successful COP? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's not a lot to be said on that issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be, and I think for this COP to be successful, mm -hmm. for this COP to truly be an African COP, it mm -hmm. needs to take African experiences and African um, solutions and African, the African climate crisis very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. Uh, and by Africa I also mean, you know, the developing world. I also mean the, the South, the global South. Mm -hmm. So being able to take loss and damage seriously, finance very seriously, and, you know, implement these things because we're, I mean, I talked about it the other day about what it means to really be in the space, what it means to really be, you know, um, here. What What is the point of Africans coming to these summits if there's no real action that translates in, onto the ground? You know, we kind of give the fossil fuel industry more ammunition to talk better about the failure of multilateralism. And, that, and we can't afford to do that, um, particularly now when it comes to issues of energy transition and where Africa needs to go. And, you know, where Africa can actually leapfrog these, um, backward, uh, old, um, you know, systems of energy. So that's literally, I think, what, what we need to do at this COP to just represent Africa mm -hmm. in its entirety, but also communities on the ground at the same time. Yeah. And I'll, I'll echo what, uh, guests. Uh, earlier on on the podcast said, he said fossil fuel companies are literally operating in the same systems that the colonialists did. And so if we really want to move away from, I mean, we really need that um, opportunity to make decisions for ourselves, to create change within our communities and really define what our priorities are mm. and what our needs are and not have them using the same systems to control us. 100%. And I even think the same narratives mm -hmm. to control us, you know, uh, you know, those narratives of prosperity, those narratives of development, those narratives of a just energy transition being yeah. captured mm -hmm. by that industry is, yeah. you know, it's, it's, we need to be able to tell the difference. You know, we need to be able to think about the smoke and mirrors that's happening yeah. at the COP or that's happening in and around Africa when it comes to the colluding of the fossil fuel industry with mm -hmm. governments, with even, you know, institutions, mm -hmm. African institutions. So we need to really think about um, what's really happening, the new scramble of Africa that's really happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I told you, remember at the beginning, I said we were not at the forefront of climate, energy and development. So yeah. when we really think about the scramble of Africa right now, we mm -hmm. need to take that seriously. We need to call that out as colonialism. We need to talk about where Africa needs to lead, Yeah, you know, not to be led. Yeah. I think that's a really good call to end with. Yeah. And I think... That's a very triggering term because we had, in history, we used to learn about the scramble and partitioning of Africa. And yeah. it's so interesting to see it happening right now again. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much, thank for, you so much. for your patience and for being on the podcast. And yeah, I look forward to seeing what Hansa is going to do in the next couple of years. I'm excited as well for this podcast and where this is going to be going. So thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.